the Opepco studios in Oklahoma City. You're watching the Press Row. I'm Jenny Carlson here with Barry Trammell, and we're brought to you by Papa John's Pizza. Go online to papajohns.com and check out all their online specials. It's a great football season meal. All right, let's get started with the inbox. Your email questions here on video. Let's start with Eli. Eli says, why didn't Trevor Knight run the ball once against West Virginia? OU recruited the guy largely because of the fact that he's a dual threat quarterback. So why does it look like he's being groomed to be Landry Jones, Barry? Well, I've got uh, two words for you. Samaje and P. Ryan. <laughs> Anytime OU ran the ball with somebody other than uh, Samaje P. Ryan the other night, we all said, what's going on? Give the ball to the big fella. But uh, OU's clearly trying to protect Trevor Knight. And lo and behold, in Morgantown, the running game was spectacular, mostly with P. Ryan. Alex Ross had a nice run as well, had 56 yards on eight carries. So the running game was working without putting uh, Trevor Knight at risk. Yeah. So, hey, when Samaji P. Ryan is running like that, don't let anybody else have the ball. Yeah, and you know what? I think, I mean, there are a lot of people asking about Trevor Knight and the run game, but the truth is they haven't needed it. Now, some people retorted when I've said that before in the last few days and said, well, what about the first half when they weren't necessarily uh, running up the score? was tied 24-24 at half. They were in just fine shape. And let's remember, if Trevor Knight gets hurt, Cody Thomas is your next option. Baker Mayfield is not available to the Sooners right now. Maybe if he gets eligible, they change it up. But in my mind, if you can get to the football, the college football playoff and not have Trevor Knight having run a bunch and injured himself, well, then you take off Great. the shackles and run like crazy if you want to. But if they can get there without it, What's all the, what's all the hand wringing? They're four and zero. They're just fine. All right, back to the inbox. This one from Kent. Two teams persisted to run the stupid shotgun. Clemson and Mississippi State. One it cost, the other almost. And this is talking about running out of the shotgun every single snap, Barry. Yeah, both these teams had uh, third and short or second and short, whatever the case may be. And clearly, uh, you know, time to get under center and run some power. And bad snaps mess up the game. Mississippi State survived. Clemson did not. But what Ken is talking about has some validity, which, uh, you know, around here, our teams, they run shotgun yep. exclusively almost. And uh, we remember when Brandon Whedon <laughs> shotgun city uh, at OSU yeah. and uh, down he went the, under center on and the goal. It. That's exactly right. And I told Ken, that's why they don't do it is to uh, to the uh, these shotgun teams. The, uh, the center snap has become routine in the shotgun. Mm -hmm. Getting under center is when you have trouble. I think the problem is, though, on second and goal from the one, third and goal from the one, fourth and goal from the one. When you still see teams in the shotgun, it drives you nuts because clearly under center is the better strategy. You can get the running game uh, more quickly, more downhill uh, running. So the shotgun has its advantages. Yeah. It also has its negatives. Well, and I think that, you know, the football purists see, especially when you're down on the goal line and you've essentially got inches to go and you snap it and suddenly it's four yards to go or five yards to go. With the snap, you've essentially backed yourself up in a way that where the ball was before, if you just snap it, you're practically across the goal line. So I think there's, you know, there's sort of calculus going on there saying, wait a second, isn't this just a dumb mathematical move and, and I get it but at the same time when you practice one thing again and again and again the risk of actually snapping it sometimes becomes a bigger risk in the calculus so teams got to make that decision and sometimes it backfires now let's go back to the inbox from Don Don says hey who was Millen Pusker and this is the name of West Virginia's stadium Civil War General coal miner Senator, Senator Robert Byrd's campaign manager? <laughs> I like the last suggestion the best. Could be. <laughs> Robert Byrd was in the U.S. Senate, I think, from 1820 until <laughs> uh, 1999. Uh, but Might be a little bit of a stretch. A little bit. Here's the deal. Uh, I had to look it up. Mylon Pusker, you know, everybody knows who Boone Pickens is. Uh, but uh, I, I told, uh, I, w I responded to Don and said, uh, Mylon Pusker was uh, Floyd Casey's second cousin. And of course, that's the uh, anonymous uh, name on the, uh, on the name of old uh, Baylor Stadium. Got a new stadium now, of course. But uh, Mylon Pusker was a guy who was not actually a West Virginia guy. He had uh, gone to school at Penn State or someplace, came to Morgantown, made a bunch of money, uh, became a West Virginia fan, gave them $20 million or something to uh, build their stadium in 1980. So... That's who Mylon Pusker was. It's, uh, it's not a name that rolls off the tongue. As much as I love West Virginia being in the league, and everybody knows I've become an avowed mountaineer, 
But uh, the name of the stadium is not one of the more lyrical things in college football. Well, and you know, it sort of begs the question, you know, some of these stadiums that have come, names that have come and gone, just recently I was sort of reminded of Lewis Field at OSU, which, you know, Mr. Lewis didn't do anything, but he lost his name off the stadium when Boone Pickens came along. I wonder if there, is there any West Virginia alum that might be angling to get Mr. Pusker's name off the, the stadium. Well, Any uh, really rich ones? I don't know. You know what? They, they've discovered quite a bit of oil and gas in West Virginia, so uh, Look out, they Mr. got it going Pusker. like we do. Coming for you. All right, back to the inbox. This one comes from Jefferson. He says, what effect does ESPN's deal with the SEC network and the Longhorn network have on their reporting? I think a valid question here, Barry. It's a valid question, and it's a common question. Everybody asks it, and my response is this. I think it affects it on the SEC network and on the Longhorn network. If you want to hear how everything is great in Austin, just turn to the Longhorn network. <laughs> if you want to hear how great the SEC, well, what? Wait you a minute. Turn what, a lot of places to hear how great. What is great in Austin with Longhorn? Uh, well, nothing. I, mean, they, 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 I don't know. They go down to Sixth Street and I tell us how great it is down I, there. I think they're talking about maybe the uh, rafting on the uh, oh, okay. on the Colorado River. Very good. But uh, anyway, now you get a lot of SEC love everywhere, but. The SEC deserves it. They've dominated college football. They've dom had great wins this year. I personally don't think ESPN has gone overboard with the, uh, with the SEC love. Uh, it is the dominant conference. If, uh, if the Big 12 wants that kind of love, beat Auburn when you get the chance. Yeah. Beat uh, Texas A&M in the Cotton Bowl when you get the chance. Beat Missouri in the Cotton Bowl when you get the chance. Beat somebody in the Cotton Bowl when you get the chance. The Big 12's <laughs> won once in the last 14 years. So that's my point. I, I think ESPN's done okay. I don't think they've gone overboard with their reporting on those two issues. Yeah, and I, I think that definitely the Longhorn Network, it, it, it's, I think it's kept to the Longhorn Network. Now, they may have more video of things on the, on the flagship stations because of the Longhorn Network situation, but you don't see a, a bunch of, uh, boy, the Longhorns are doing great. So I don't see that at all now. With the SEC, I do think, and, and Barry, you've written this, I think we've talked about this, the fact that when it comes down to the end, you got a politic. And maybe not even the end, because Bob Stoops is clearly on the politicking trail for his team right now to say, hey, listen, uh, just because we're not in the SEC doesn't mean that we don't play good football in the Big 12. Now, I, I think you can dispute that, as you mentioned, with those non-conference losses that the, the Big 12 suffered. But um, I think the politicking t coaches are going to have to make the case for their teams and for their leagues. Bob Stoops is doing that. The SEC has long done that. I think other people, sometimes you have to hop on that train or you might get left behind when it comes down to the end. Hey, be sure to stay with the best coverage team anywhere at newsok.com and every day in the Oklahoman.